Hello, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and uh, good night for those in the other side of the world. Um, welcome for this first time uh, noise and management off in offshore installation webinar being run this time by myself, Daniel Alvarez, and uh, my colleague Pia Anderson in Copenhagen. Um, we'll just, in order to just set the scene here, we, we both, uh, both of us work in the in the lowest, reg lowest register organization, uh, uh, which is the largest chari largest charity charity organization in the UK, um, and our 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 main objective is, is uh, always trying to serve clients in regards to uh, safety and safety for the world. So. Um, just a bit on, on, on this, uh, we, we normally work in, in the oil and gas sector, um, delivering consultancy services uh, around noise and vibration. So I'll bring it over to Pia for you to introduce yourself. Yes, hello everyone, my name is Pia Tøjgaard Andersen, I'm based in Copenhagen, and I'm a noise and vibration uh, consultant, I've been there for 25 years, working in oil and gas marine industry uh, within uh, also acoustics. Uh, but mainly noise and vibration. Yeah, excellent. My, my name, as I said, is Daniel Alvarez. I work in the office in Singapore. Uh, I've been 15 years in this field, uh, doing my studies back in Denmark, and I mostly have done work in the marine and oil and gas sector. So just to set a bit on this scene, we, we, I'm going to go through the, through the noise management, what we believe is, is uh, in our organization, the best way how to tackle noise and vibration in, uh, in projects. Um, and uh, later on, K, uh, Pierre is going to take a bit on the case studies, uh, which, which will show you a bit on the application in regards to this. So, um, just to set a bit on, on the scene of what we are talking about, uh, this this picture, and I apologize for this being in Norwegian, that shows a bit on the numbers in regards to reported hearing damages um, through the years, or well, actually it's a bit all. Yet the number on the top right shows more or less what we are talking about so in, 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 a, in, in a country heavily regulated as yes, in Norway there are still things happening in regards to hearing damage and and that's that's uh, that's really surprising in, in many cases but uh, it does happen and if, and if you look at into into work related illnesses uh, in general uh, noise is still be, is being one of the of the major concerns and this is uh, disregarding anything to do with uh, injuries or emergency um, accidents so uh, anything related to work um, work related uh, matters so um, the next slide shows also a similar picture um, in, in particular for Singapore where I actually work mostly and this is this is not necessarily offshore but it shows a similar situation when it comes to the report of what is called here occupational diseases. So out of 799 reported in 2017, you're looking at about more than half of it being related to somehow into noise-induced deafness. Um, and, and Singapore is not is not too behind in, in terms of leg legislation um, uh, as compared to the to the Nor Norwegian uh, the Norwegian sector. Um, just a bit to set a bit more on the scene in Malaysia, where we have a, a country six times larger than, than, than Singapore or, or Norway. You're looking at about 3,000 reported um, um, injuries related to, to work, and out of them, there's, there's about 2,800 that are somehow related to, um, to hearing loss. So what we're looking at, and despite that all the efforts many companies and, and in general the industry uh, do towards tackling noise and vibration in, in, in the working environment, so we, we, we do see continuous issues. So basically what, what, what we look at, uh, for those of you that, that, that the work in, in, in noisy environments, we're definitely looking at an agent that is probably going to cause you hearing loss. Um, Stress, high blood pressure, headaches, and so on. It's, it's, it's a number of things. We, we even go into say that noise may be fatal in the event that uh, alarms are not heard, of course. And uh, and obviously we affect not only our working conditions but the comfort when you whenever you are sitting in a ship or in a platform or um, or even at your at your property um, as well as the environment. So we're looking at uh, something that is affecting. Uh, uh, affecting in general the 
various various areas. So um, and 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 setting the, the 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 type of work we deliver in the marine and offshore work, um, we're looking at the compact environments uh, where we have a large number of sources, and uh, um, as well as a stru the, the fact that we have a structure uh, bore noise playing a significant role, uh, as we have a steel type of structures uh, where where vibration propagate throughout the facility very easily, um, and we also are looking at an indoor climate control, um, which is which is also a source of noise. Um, limited space, where sometimes some of the projects are looking at weight. What what is it the the, the weight impact you're going to cause in regards to noise control measures? And often, um, and this is applicable for drilling rigs mostly, facilities need to be movable. They need to drill in various parts of the world. And therefore, compliance with regulations uh, are well. Basically, basically, you want to comply anywhere in the world when it comes to noise and vibration requirements. So you don't have any prevention on operations. So that's, that's a bit on this scene. And I think I think when I, based on, on all the experience we gather, and and uh, from from the days uh, from the early days I started working on this as well as uh, PA, we, we we think that a lot of the acoustician role uh, is to do with uh, with these few few bullet points here. So one of the things is understanding the targets. We we have we have always had um, projects that that, uh, that mention a type of a standard. It can be an ISO standard. It can relate to NORSOC. It can relate to various. But but the project itself is is often not um, it's often not linking directly to what is it the project is is aiming for. Uh, there will be always variations and there will be always deviations that we we have to apply because sometimes the project is simply is not able to meet the requirement. But I think I think throughout we we, we spend a lot of time doing just simply on the targets, uh, believe it or not. Um, we we often think that the dialogue between contractors, these being these, these being those constructing offshore installations, um, uh, the OEMs or the manufacturers of equipment and the noise and vibration solution companies, um, uh, is is crucial. It's crucial to understand what is it that you are predicting in, a, in an early phase of a project, and it's crucial to understand what are the contributions you, the machines you are buying are bringing to your facility. And, and once you know once you know that, it's also crucial to know what is it that your noise and vibration solutions will bring to the project. Um, once once we get into that, we'll, we'll always find an optimal combination of noise control measures. Um, the, the, there are other disciplines playing a role as well, like safety or um, fire protection, where where we have to touch base and our materials or our control measures may play a role. And of course, we we have to base our our judgment on on some kind of rela reliable noise prediction. So uh, we we always say, and and uh, the earlier we get into into projects, the earlier you get acousticians into projects is uh, the better because you 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 understand what we're looking at. So I think if you look at what it, what will be the value for the project in general, I think we 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 look at uh, preventing hearing loss before it happens. We because once it happens, it's, it's, it's never back. Minimizing the risk of expensive retrofitting uh, in connection to noise and vibration control. And we, we have managed in some cases to enhance the reduction by tailoring the control measures to specific design. So we, we run a number of um, noise prediction package. You, you, may, you may recognize some of these, and some of these are related to commercial software um, like uh, Canada sound plan or various doing outdoor modeling, this noise indoor modeling, this is insulation analysis, structure born evaluation of HVAC, vibration studies, and I'll I'll just go and run through through this one by one uh, with a bit a little more of detail. Um, but but basically the message on this slide is 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 what is written. That I, I, it, the the basic message on, on this is we we need to choose the right combination of tools. Um, for a specific application. Uh, it's not only about knowing how to write and build a model, but also you need to combine very often various various types of, of contributions and uh, having the set of best uh, available tools will bring, will bring you 
closer to what is the future scenario on, on your modeling. So when it comes to outdoor noise prediction study, um, we, we we typically focus on the working environments, as I said. Um, we, we look at the potential control measures. So this this tool will all, will also allow us to to see what happens, for instance, in corridors. It's pretty useful when you want to reduce uh, and the exposure in certain areas, and and you're deciding to go into some kind of screening type of control. Um, we obviously we use it for protection signage location in general, um, and hopefully this will go collect at some point in projects to to the life cycle of uh, of this asset. In this case, we're looking at a few platforms or or FPSOs, where where we we'll reach to that project that we manage to pass down this information to the doctors or medic in charge of the facility. Um, that they give it gives them a, a tool to to see what they are looking at when it comes to noise exposure. What is important is that this type of modeling requires a lot of reliable noise data. And unfortunately, that, that is that is something that we we, we spent a lot of time to to um, understand what the vendors are trying to, to convey and and utilize the right data for our modeling. Similar situation when it comes to noise at indoor machinery areas. Um, basically, uh, as opposed to to the outdoor case, we we typically don't have um, we obviously don't have the in this case we have the room effect, so the the absorption that you have and you're facing in the room and the, the reverberation time you have in the room, um, and therefore we have a differences with with an, without absorption material. Um, there's many cases where um, material is placed for fire protection purposes, uh, which can be beneficial for acoustics as well. There are other cases where, where that is not beneficial. So um, uh, often we would discuss quite a bit with whatever is coming uh, in, in regards to to other disciplines for, for other purposes in the facilities. Um, again, I mentioned that we require reliable noise database here because again, that's, that's the nature, the nature of, of this modeling. Um, and the structure bore noise very often plays a role, especially when you have had um, a noise control in place, like an, an enclosure, and the direct sound field is is somehow uh, reduced, and, and piping starts taking a bit of uh, the, the the largest contribution to the noise in the in the working environment. Um, when it comes to insulation, um, we we, we this pertains particularly those spaces where where people will rest during the time that they are working, uh, during the time they are on duty, uh, and and uh, obviously you want them to have rest uh, while they well after after a long day working, and it's it's very important to to apply what we normally call a box in box concept. So we want to look at every kind of path that uh, noise propagation path into an indoor space that would um, that would mean uh, contribution. Uh, this goes for on the right side as you see the, the the noise propagated from outdoors typically through through the bulkhead and uh, um, the fire fire material or fire protection and uh, an indoor and an inside paneling. Um, it could also be through through windows um, and and we also refer to a structural bore noise that coming from the ground from from the floor. Um, transmission path into the next rooms and through the ceiling space. That, that is very often an issue. Uh, so the clients would, would would look at having a great panel, uh, but but the ceiling is is very weak. And and as you can see in this figure, uh, transmission water noise just simply works as water. When the moment that you leave a little bit of leak, it, energy will just fly in through. Um, and and therefore we always aim to have a panel with similar similar uh, or or more isolation properties than than the ceiling system. If you have a system that is is giving you 30 degree isolation on the ceiling, and you have a 50 panel, there's no point to pay for the 50 panel point. So we we often work here on also on on trying to reduce the costs. So should you use uh, 50 millimeter paneling? Should you use um, um, different type of lining 
with or perforated or unperforated paneling. So the, it, we, we have to combine all the types of uh, contributions in, in, into the isolation assessment, uh, insulation assessment. When it comes to HVAC noise, HVAC noise runs through through the, the ducting um, and it goes through both the supply, the return, as well as sometimes the, the exhaust in the event you have. Um, so there are three three main sources. And, and of course you have all types of fines through. Um, and we, we definitely have a look at what it is uh, coming through each of those lines. Um, it, is a, it is a good practice to have a um, silencer as close as possible to the sensitive area. Um, we, we have had those cases, but also we have to have silencers very close to the main sources. So very often you're looking at a combination of various silencers in installation to, to, to mitigate in the best possible manner um, noise being propagated there. Um, it's also important to mention that it, 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 is very much uh, affecting machinery spaces. A lot, a lot of contractors will go into into having a silencer just just downstream of a of a supply fan, just aiming to mitigate the noise that runs through the. Uh, assuming that, that noise goes goes with the flow, but it, it isn't the case. Noise goes both upstream and downstream of any particular fan. So so we have, uh, many times we, we encounter issues when it, when it comes to spacing. So the, the design is ready. There's simply no space to put another silencer. Um, and again, the, early, the, the earlier the better, we'll have time for that. Um, structure board noise is, is typical, uh, a typical issue or a typical, um, uh, one of the most strongest areas that we work on uh, it's, it's 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 very much related to to steel structures as i said and and very much more in connection to drilling rigs um when it comes to fpsos for instance the the, the fpsos are, have a, a different type of setup and yes we do we do the studies but but we encounter less issues with structural bonus in general in order to, for you to perform this, as you can imagine from this diagram on the right side, um, we have a source, and uh, the source uh, generates vibration on the deck, which easily propagates at various uh, at various lengths, uh, at many anywhere in the rig, many in in a facility, um, and then vibration touches any type of sensitive area where you start having some vibration, which at the end given the properties of any material, will radiate somehow noise. And in some cases, radiation may be very significant. Um, particularly by, and the floor is, is, is one of the largest surfaces that typically have a lot of radiation of noise. So for, for you to predict, uh, is our opinion that we have to have, uh, obviously, a, a bunch of information in regards to the source strength, or meaning in the vibration the sources are able to, pro to put into the structure. Uh, what sort of energy propagation uh, or dam um, you, you characteristics, characteristics you have. Um, we normally would go into empirical or potentially statistical assessment. Then you need to have the material dampening information. So what type of flooring you're gonna use on those two figures on the, on the bottom line to show um, basically the type of flooring you can use. Many times we have to use a very comprehensive uh, flooring covering. Um, to mitigate structural vibration in general. And then finally, what are the radiation properties of each receiver? So the paneling, how, how likely is to radiate? Um, and whether it's gonna catch a resonance, for instance, it may, it may as well happen. So <clears throat> in our experience, um, we typically would run um, this, this, uh, this initial calculation where, where we have an empirical assessment. Um, and and later on we would do a statistical in the event on those areas that we have ma major issues. When it comes to the the vibration, uh, you may you may see in your facility a lot of a lot of um, sources that that are generating vibration on the deck. And uh, one of the most important uh, factors in order to prevent vibration is ensure you have sufficient stiffness below the the, the point the mounting points. You, you see in that uh, figure uh, final element modeling on top that you have a number of connecting points. Those are the points where um, 
where you uh, where you you have the forces being injected, and you have to make sure that the force relationship between force and the velocity you're causing in the deck is not too high. That's what we call mobility, and and it, it's it's dependent on the frequency, and we often deliver this for major equipment, so anything to do with uh, main engines, main center, main compressors at low frequencies, um, main uh, thrusters um, are causing major sources in the structure. Uh, we ought to assess how we can mitigate this. So this is this is pertaining the structural team of any project. And as a, as a rule of thumb, we typically say that our foundation is going to be at least 10 times stiffer than AVM and, and then the ABM uh, stiffness. So as uh, for those of you, you're curious on that, AVM, the AVM would have a natural frequency again. Uh, and we have to assess what type of natural frequency you are, how far you are from the excitation. Uh, and then also you have to know, make sure what is the type of stiffness you're, stiffness you're looking at. For other equipment, like small pumps in this case is showing a 35 kilogram uh, AVM mounting, so very small units. We typically would do a run, uh, a quick run through to see uh, those major factors. So we are looking at deck foundation, um, how how uh, very quick assessment, basically the arrangement you have below on the beams. We would select an anti-vibration mount uh, and also look at resonance on plate resonance on plate fields. This is to do with whole body vibration we're causing nearby both the previous slide and this one touch into that. Um, and finally, obviously, we, we need to know what type of anti-vibration mounts you have in the market. Um, and that, that, that it is important to have an important role, uh, a good database in this topic. Uh, finally, and probably not entirely to do with uh, with uh, human exposure to, to this, but uh, we've, we've lately have participated in a number of interesting events around uh, underwater noise. And I just decided to put this slide on because um, there are more and more regulations on this. So any, any type of operation today uh, offshore, it, it really uh, starts to having requirements in regards to noise propagation. The, 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 the figure on the left top is showing more as the propagation on a piling operation. So this is this is either to do with wind turbines or um, yeah any type of piling um, where the propagation of, of noise in underwater noise is, is significant. You can see it. Um, you, you, you see you see some some noise at very long distances. So we've uh, we've done this type of things and we we typically do it also with measurements. So it is often part of the commissioning phase of projects. So in order for me to conclude around this topic and then pass it over to Pia, uh, I like to say that obviously I think it's really important that you know the noise will cost will, will may cause significant cost in your project, uh, and we can also cause a lot of damage to your employees, um, which is really important. The overall co the overall cost in general can be controlled and can be reduced by considering noise as early as possible. Um, we unfortunately many cases come very late. In other cases, we come just on time. In other cases, um, around a bit too late. Every every project is just different, and it really depends on the on the region where it takes place. But the earlier, the better. It doesn't mean that um, that that still remains for everything. I think it's always important to have experienced uh, experienced people to do this type of work. And the final solution into modeling and predicting for us is a, a theoretical and empirical information in regards to the noise and vibration sources you're having and all the material you're using. You have to play a lot with, with architectural guys that are for, perhaps very happy to have a different type of material than the one you have. You have to have a lot with OEMs. You have a lot of, a lot of piping. Um, in, in, in this facility, so you have a lot of to do with with a piping engineer delivering this type of work. So um, I think it's it's a combination of um, um, theoretical information and whatever you've got a, an empirical data. So and finally, I think the, the bunch of basically tools you have out in the market that everyone can go and buy is is pretty. Um, is relatively simple to operate, uh, but the fact is that we, we need to use the right combination 
and um, for each specific application. Um, so Scope Noise uh, is, contrib is a result of various contributions, and you have to you have to gather all of them together somehow in order to to have the right representation. Okay, uh, that's what I had for now. So. Yeah, the first case story here is about uh, Western Lara. This was a project that we uh, did some years, a couple of years back here. It, it was an example of a, of a jack-up uh, drilling rig that was built in a, in a yard in Singapore. And it had a bit of a troubles burst into this world here because the original owner actually went bankrupt and the yard continued the, uh, the, the production of the, of the rig. And then it was finally bought by the company Sea Drill, and they were planning to bring it into Norway, uh, the Norwegian sector for an operation there. And for those of you who know the Norwegian sector, then that is the uh, the sector with the most stringent requirements to noise and operation in the world. So uh, they are very, very serious uh, people when it comes to noise and, and vibration control and exposure to humans. Uh, one of the problems that they faced was that they quickly learned that there were some very, very serious problems on this rig here. One of the major problems was that the uh, living quarter, uh, it, it was when we came into the project, the living quarter was uh, almost complete. It was fully uh, set up with panels, with furniture, with carpets and so on. And at that point they realized there was something wrong with the sound insulation between the cabins, and it was actually very, very critical. And the problem is that during these projects here, the Norwegian authorities, the PSA, the Petroleum Safety Authorities, they do audits during a project, uh, a construction project, if, if, the, if the intended installation is to go into Norwegian sector. And, and uh, they, they uh, actually did this audit, and, and they actually found that there, the lack of, of uh, of control of this problem was so severe that they were actually facing a risk of being rejected access into the Norwegian sector. And uh, so they were facing major reconstruction costs, which would cost a lot of money. But the worst thing was actually that they were facing penalties for not meeting the contract they had signed, which was actually the biggest cost. So this was a, a huge, huge problem for them. So can you click on the next slide? Then? You can see one of the things, that, as I mentioned here, was the living quarter. The requirements in the Norwegian sector, that is, that the sound insulation, the attenuation between cabins should be somewhere between 40 and 45 for single men cabins here. And what was measured was actually 31 and 34. And just to put it into perspective, this was so bad that you could speak between the cabins. So you can actually hear conversation going on in the, in the other cabin. So it was it was not just a number problem, it was actually a, 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 a serious problem on, on, the, on, on, the, uh, on the installation itself. What it turned out to be was that the panels they had used for the living quarter, they were actually labeled wrongly, or, or more correctly to say that the, the label didn't fit what the panels actually produced. So most likely somehow there were some changes made to the construction of the wall panels they had used, uh, so, uh, where they simply reduced the sound insulation of the wall panels by 10 to 15 dB and never discovered it. And now they are in this situation, they have built the entire accommodation with wall panels that doesn't meet the requirements. So uh, we had to come up with a, a solution uh, to this one here. So this is this was not the yard's problem, you can say, this was the problem of the manufacturer, not uh, being able to to or have, have simply false declarations on, on their wall panels. But nevertheless, now it was the oil companies and the yard problem that they were looking into tearing down the entire almost complete accommodation and rebuild it from scratch. Yes, uh, next slide. Yep. So what you what we did was that we, we conducted a lot of laboratory tests on these panels here and we came up with a solution where you could where you could actually improve the existing panels by gluing on steel plates to the sides. So what you, you what you could do is simply add mass to both sides of the of the uh, these uh, 
non-conforming uh, panels and, and nearby crews in, increase the, the sound insulation of this. And we actually managed to get it because some of the furnitures on these rigs, they, they are uh, fixed in, in, installed to the walls. And we actually managed to uh, be able to adjust these steel panels to fit around the furniture because there was actually no need of removing the furniture. So they uh, simply added on all the critical wall panels, if you can just click once more, I think there's a small drawing showing uh, the where we added the panels. As you can see, uh, basically various levels of various requirements, then panels were added uh, to the uh, to various places in this one here. And actually they managed to, to go on to this. Next slide, please. There was a lot, there was just one of the problems that was, that was occurring in this one here. And the other problem was that they have had a fundamental problem in the hull. In, in Norway, they have requirements to main walkways where you have a lot of traffic and the requirement is 60 to 80 to B. And what you see in the picture on the left here is the, the original walkway where you have a lot of equipment facing out to the walkway. So they had to put up uh, noise barriers uh, to seal off the, uh, the uh, walkway, as you see on the, on the right picture here. The other problem, which also was pretty large, was that they they kind of forgot the problem that Daniel mentioned here, that sound travels both ways in ventilation systems. People have a tendency to believe that noise only propagates downstream following the airflow, but that's not the case. It propagates both ways. So it, that would typically lead to problems where you have uh, ventilation exhaust on the main deck, which uh, then produce too much noise and, and, uh, and, and exceed the noise limits on the main deck. So what they had to do is to add multiple silencers on, on this one here. So yeah, basically you, you lift the existing uh, grill, put top and put in a silencer and install this one. So it wasn't too bad on this one, but it can be, problematic in cases where you have uh, space problems. Here's uh, an example. This is the chiller arrangement. Unfortunately, these, these big chillers, they were located right on top of some cabins. So just below this field up here, there are some cabins below. But at, at least they thought that there was a, a problem or could be a problem. So they fitted by anti-vibration mounts or AVMs on below the unit here. This is what's indicated by the red circle here. The problem is that they mounted the AVMs on a very soft foundation. So you can see if they, below the AVM, it's just a piece of steel sticking out without any support. So this is a very soft structure. So the AVM was simply not working in this particular uh, example here. So that had to be modified too. They also had problems with on the in the uh, in the uh, 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 cantilever. This was a big cantilever where they have uh, HPSUs for the drilling operation, and they had problems with the draw works. They were simply producing too much noise, so they had to be screened off. So you had uh, a solution with a proper screening wall uh, on the draw work in the uh, in, on the HPSU. We ended up using some noise curtains in, in, instead to this one here. Here you can see some pictures of the draw work. What's particular with the uh, with the draw work on this one here, which is a construction we see is often is that you can see the draw work is located on an elevated level behind the green structure or the green barrier that was uh, put up on, on in this area here. So this is to give more space on the drill floor, obviously here, but that poses uh, some special problems. Yep, next slide. Here's another example of a problem we experienced on the drill floor because on the drill floor, it, it can be very noisy. And then in the, this is the roof of the drill cabin. And in the drill cabin, they made this ventilation opening, which is basically a hole in the roof. So when you make a hole, then noise would propagate into the driller cabin. So a, a simple solution to treat this is to uh, put up a, a, a silencer in the open. This is something which is typically put up. As I mentioned, this uh, this structure, the, the stiff structure, uh, the drawback structure was mounted on an elevated uh, structure uh, above the drill floor. 
that actually caused some uh, spatial problems. It was it was actually located on a very soft piece of the structure. And what you see on the right moving here, that's called an operational deflection shape or an ODS, which shows the amplified movement of the drill structure. So you can see this is mainly a matter of horizontal movement. So you can see the, the entire structure is simply moving back and forth in, in the structure. And on the left, you can see the point element calculation illustrating more or less the same. So they have, they had some problems with vibration on this one here, and they actually managed to solve that by stiffening the structure and by adding uh, or, or by balancing to this one here. Basically, to end this small uh, case over here, so you can see what was was it actually uh, resulted in. Well, they managed to go into operation. Uh, it, there was an, a severe extra cost of, say, approximately 5 million US dollars. But this was actually small compared to the original cost that they were facing when we entered into the project here. So what are the main lessons <laughs> learned in this one here? Well, this is to us an example of what happens if you don't take noise into consideration in the early phases. And it's very important that you follow up the project continuously during the construction. And just to look at the most severe problem that they have with the cabins, how, how could they have discovered that? Well, they could have made a mock-up of cabin test. I have an example of this one here. This is something which is very common for Norwegian project. You simply build a small section of the living quarter and fit it out with all the panels and all the furnitures, and then you measure on that. If they have done this in this particular case, they could have discovered this problem, which uh, was actually not the yard problem, but the producer's problem. Okay, that was the first. Next one here is about a um, an large FPSO project that we have been working on. This is a project where we came into the uh, to the early phases of the project. This is an FPSO called Goliath. It's going to be located very far north, up at the at the, at the, the Norwegian sector. Also, uh, this is, was actually when it was planned. It was the most northern offshore manned construction in the world. So when you see here a picture of it after it was uh, being told in, you can see it was a design called a Saban 1000 FPSO. Uh, that's a company that made the final uh, or the basic design. They had a lot of challenges being so far north. There's obviously a harsh environment. They uh, had ice problems and uh, there was uh, had a requirement of very low acceptability level for, for uh, working related injuries. So that's this one here. It was built to the Norwegian standard North Sock, the 002, as you see here. And as I mentioned in the first presentation here, this is actually one of the strictest uh, requirements in the in the world on this one here. You can see it's actually details very specifically what you have to do in different uh, stages of the project. So you have to start by concept evaluation, do feed evaluation, do noise specifications, and you have to follow up and design. And then you have to do a factory acceptance test, and, and it actually describes quite accurately what you have to do. So uh, we have some examples of what, what that actually meant in this particular project. Uh, can you take the next slide? Then as you can see, yeah, just to highlight the requirements here that stated in this NORSOC, it has requirements to the personal noise exposure. This is originated from EU requirement. Most countries have this now, but on top of this, they had specific area noise requirements, requirements to emergency noise. They had requirements of what is the maximum noise level in cabins when you have helicopter operations. Obviously, they had strict requirements, HVAC to sound insulation, the sound insulation between cabin, especially there's something called acoustic comfort where you actually specify a minimum amount of sound absorbing material in order to improve intelligibility of the PA systems, but also to lower noise and they have requirements to vibrations also. So a lot of requirements that need to be uh, fit in here. You can see on the right here, you can see there's a, there's a a screen, a, a, a table from, from this NORSOC state, stating what are the requirements. And you can see for each of 
the the areas on the platform then there's a total noise requirement saying what is the total noise level and then there's an HVAC requirement which is the rightmost column on the table here what is important is that when you say the requirement to total noise or the uh, as, as in the second column from the right then that means the sum of all the contributions you can find so this means noise from the equipment it could be the structure bore noise and it could be HVAC noise and noise from outside the the room you have to add all of those together and then you get the total noise level which you can compare with the area noise limits in this case so the next slide here they're going to show some examples of how we do that for the internal airborne noise in simplified rooms you can see this is a, an example of how we do it you you can put you can get data from vendors and then you can put them into a calculation model this is our own in-house developed tool they call in up uh, if you have more complex geometries we tend to use a software called Odeon, where you basically can do the same, but just the, the calculation methodology is suited for more complex geometries. The first one was just for simple geometry, but when you have like a complex geometry like here for, uh, for a lot of areas and it is. One important thing to consider, of course, is the pipe noise, which is a huge noise source on, on most areas. So, for this, we have developed our own in-house in tool where we can actually predict the noise from you know, pipe systems. We also do a risk of acoustic fatigue uh, in the pipes, especially if, have, if some valve configurations, you can have very, very high noise levels, which actually can cause fatigue within a few minutes. It's a very it's a safety issue. We do structure bond noise predictions. You can see an example here. This is also from an in-house developed tool. Uh, where we do predictions, we either use a transfer function based method or statistical energy based. But what it ends up is actually giving the structure bore noise level originating from vibrations from the various sources. What it enables us to do is that we, I think Daniel also showed it on the first slide here, they enable us to, to, uh, to recommend uh, various floor types in, in various areas on, on the installation. So you can see actually this one is, is uh, illustrating a viscoelastic floor and a floating floor where you, depending on what you need and the vicinity of the, or the, or the uh, how close the sources are. We've done outdoor noise predictions. In this particular case, we use the software CAPNA. And you can see on the left picture, the blue fields, they are indicating the, the noise sources. So you can see there was a lot of opening there was natural ventilation on this platform and uh, it was actually propagating a lot out to especially the lay down areas so we had to come up with a solution where we made sound insulated uh, you can say loop was like indicated on the outside inside drawing and below so we combined uh, absorption and, and the steel plate in, in this one here Then what is very important is that we do all of these predictions based on as empirical values of the uh, sound. Uh, and then we, this is typically done during the feed phase. And then we boil all of these calculations down to a noise specification for each piece of relevant equipment. And then you put it into these noise data sheets as you see them here. So this is where all the calculations come together. And then you specify what is the maximum noise emission from each piece of equipment that would lead to compliance with the noise limits in, in the in the various areas. So this is obviously a core thing for this one here. On top of the normal airborne noise, we also specify structure bore noise requirements in, in this particular case. This is not always the problem. If it's difficult to get airborne noise data, I mean normal airborne noise data, then it's from vendors, then it's very, very difficult to get structure for noise data. Most vendors will not have these data. So we, we for these things, have to rely a lot on our our measure databases uh, on this one here. But it, this enables us to specify what type of anti-vibration mounts or ADMs should you use on the project. We also looked extensively on the foundation uh, 
structure on, on Goliath here, as, as Daniel also mentioned, the in order for anti-vibration mounts to work, then it is really, really important that the stiffness of the foundation below the ABM is sufficiently stiff. This is a particular problem if you have a huge piece of equipment which you mount on very few mounting points. For instance, a, a power turbine, which is often is mounted on only three points. Then in order to support the weight of the uh, the the entire uh, equipment, then these anti-vibration mounts need to be very stiff. And then in order for them to give any vibration isolation, the foundation needs to be even stiffer, up to something like 10 times stiffer as a rule of thumb, which can be almost impossible to achieve. So we, it, it's very important to evaluate these things. We obviously also looked a lot on the living quarter in this one here. In this particular example here, you can see we, we uh, found a problem that there was a problem with crosstalk through the ventilation system. So you can see the, the ventilation system, which is basically a return flow uh, in, in or it's the supply docks they're supplying the, the air into the cabins. But you, as I mentioned before, sound propagates both ways. So if you speak in one of these cabins, sound could actually propagate through the ventilation system and be heard in the neighboring cabin. So what you do is you have to put in a silencer in this particular case here. You also had some problems with, in, with the doors in this one here. Typically, you when you use doors with which air grills in there. So here's an example of a mock-up test which was done in Finland for this particular project. product uh, project. So they constructed a, a part of the living quarter and, and the, the tests on, on these uh, here where you actually verify before that you actually get the sound insulation that you are requesting in, in these uh, projects here. This I can only recommend to do because it's, it can save you a lot of problems. And to encounter the acoustic problem, there is a requirement, for instance, in control rooms, the acoustic condition should be damped so you have a low noise level and, and good acoustic conditions. And for this particular project, there was a special ceiling developed by a company in Nexus, which has both high sound absorption and high sound insulation. Typical ceilings, they have either, they don't have the same properties on, on both sides, but in this particular thing, we needed both properties of the ceiling. So this was specifically developed on this one here. We also did what we call noise exposure calculations, which is a combination of the noise level in in the uh, in the area and the time you spend in these areas. This is actually the main requirement, both NORSOC and and, uh, and, and uh, the EU requirements. We did FATs. Here's an example. This is factory acceptance test to make sure that the vendor has supplied us with reliable data. We go out and we measure the critical pieces of equipment. And, and actually measure the noise emission from them. And you can see there are some examples of uh, those here. We did commissioning measurements and this one here, and uh, it went into operation. Uh, in, as you can see on the left here, this is from the actual operation. And on the right, there's a picture from the construction site in Korea here. So uh, we, we haven't unfortunately received the as-built noise measurements, but we have received confirmation there was no uh, real noise problems on, on this vessel uh, so far. So that's an example of how a, a project uh, or noise can be handled in a project in a very uh, sincere way. But to my experience, this is actually what is required when you, if you really want to control noise and you have some severe penalties or if you have some, some severe consequences if you don't meet these noise requirements. And just to give you an information, the PSA, the Norwegian authorities, they had two audits on noise on this particular project during the, the, uh, the construction. So they follow up, up very, very closely to make sure that you have something which meets the requirements in the end. Yes? Thanks very much, Pierre. Um, all right, I think we have still about 10 minutes for for questions, if there's any uh, anyone 
popping up at this time. Um, basically, the, the intention of us is, is to run this because we, uh, we we brought two projects that probably are, are to do with uh, with the Norwegian or the the, the North Sea um, more, um, but we intend to bring a, a number of examples that have uh, more to do with 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 South Asia uh, and other regions of the world, uh, where probably requirements aren't that stringent. But uh, if there's any question uh, at the moment for we're we're free to answer or provide any inputs if there's anyone who who wants uh, who's curious about something there's there's a question here if uh, you have come across project where you invested in noise prediction studies and the results were not satisfactory if so did the negative results have sent cost to the organization Would you like to answer that then? Mm, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I think I think it is uh, out of the, out of all the projects we've I've run in my experience on this. Uh, I think uh, I think most of the projects. Um, I would say I, I would even say that about twenty percent of the projects we managed to get uh, close to less uh, close to minimal additional investment when it comes to noise control um, we don't what we want to do is is build a budget up front um, during the design so we know how much will be the impact to the to the company building uh, facility and then from there uh, don't come with surprises later on so um, so I think I think there's still many many times happening, and unfortunately, um, noise is is not a one of the unfortunately not not controlled to the level we would like to see. Mm. Okay. Here's another question about the uh, the use of hearing protectors. Uh, basically, the question is why uh, why you can't uh, uh, wear hearing protectors and, and just use that. I, I can perhaps answer that. In, in many countries, uh, the use of uh, ear defenders is not considered a, 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 a main line of, of, of or legal main way of, of reducing noise. So, so when you do the calculation of the noise exposure, in many countries, you are simply required to exclude any effects of hearing protection. And then uh, many countries would actually require you to uh, to 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 do noise control uh, in, instead of using just handing out hearing protections, but some countries it, it will be allowed that you can you can use ear defenders and then you can take that into account when you calculate the daily noise exposure. The problem with ear defenders is that they often do not give uh, uh, the full attenuation as they have been declared. Many ear defenders they are declared to give an attenuation of 30 dB. But due to the way people use them, then it's actually, actually they are giving far less attenuation. And if you just take them off for a short time of period, then it's it you would actually quite quickly receive a, a high noise dose uh, in, in a very short period. So that's why one of the reasons that ear defenders are are really not to consider as a main line of of, uh, of noise control. Uh, 